Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Trey Grace, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics here at the Harvard Kennedy School. And I want to welcome all of you to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum for tonight's address by Van Jones. To introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Dom Malari Sanuki is going to perform that task. He's Dom's a junior in Courier House, an economics concentrator from Houston, Texas, and is the president of the Harvard Black Men's Forum. And when I first started in this job last semester, we had a meeting with a group of student, undergraduate student leaders, and we went around the room and asked, who do you want to have us bring to the forum? Who would you like to have us come speak? And Dom said, my number one choice is Van Jones. And so uh, I'm really pleased that we were able to, to yeah. <laughs> really pleased we were able to have, uh, to have Van here, and uh, maybe I'd get a reputation for delivering <laughs> among the student leaders on campus. So Dom's going to have a formal introduction. Please join me in welcoming Dom. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Like you said, uh, last year when the IOP kind of approached uh, student leaders about uh, people we would like to see speak at the forum, you know, BMF was really uh, interested in hearing Van Jones speak. And uh, we're really excited to have that suggestion become a reality today. Uh, Mr. Jones has been a great activist and creative thinker coming up with innovative solutions for problems facing America's middle and lower class, which, I mean, we think is really important in BMF and we strive to do. Uh, Mr. Jones, you know, as an advisor to the Obama administration, he oversaw, you know, $80 billion in spending and in green recovery spending. He's got a great track record as an innovative and social, um, social entrepreneur, and he's co-founded three successful uh, nonprofits, the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights, Color of Change, and Green for All. Uh, BMF members feel like Mr. Jones really exemplifies our, uh, our core principles of brotherhood, manhood, and fidelity, and we're really excited to welcome him today. Uh, thank you. Free stuff. <laughs> Gotta love it. Oh man. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for picking me to come, and uh, thank you for letting me come. Uh, <laughs> uh, I see my brother Amaha Kasa. Uh, in the back. You guys don't know, but give him a round of applause anyway. He's one of the great, the great. Stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up, stand up. <laughs> Amaha was um, one of the great uh, leaders that we had in Oakland, a young uh, social entrepreneur who came to Oakland and really finally figured out a way to get the community of Oakland and the labor movement working together for positive things. And uh, we, we, we miss you in California. Uh, we're glad you're out here. Uh, I'm just happy to get a chance to talk about what's happening today. Uh, I'm throwing out my canned speech. Uh, I know you're sad. <laughs> He's like, but we've seen it on YouTube so many times. <laughs> uh, because something extraordinary is happening in the country. And uh, I think it opens the way uh, to a new economic possibility for the country. You know, we are in a situation where I think it's easy to forget sometimes those of us who are uh, winning in this economy, uh, how many people are not. Uh, we are in a situation where there are casualties of this great recession uh, that have not been heard from yet and are just now being heard from uh, because of this Occupy movement. But they're not a small number of people. Uh, about 20 million people who used to be in the middle class fell out of it a couple of years ago. Uh, what that means is these young veterans who are coming home are coming home, and we're all happy they're coming home, but they're coming home to no jobs. They're coming home uh, to homelessness. Uh, the homelessness rate among these young veterans is extraordinary. Uh, their unemployment rate is much higher than the normal uh, population. 17 suicide attempts a day. 17 suicide attempts every single day by these young veterans. What are they coming home to? We have a generation of young people, many of you, who graduate every spring. That used to be a happy thing, right? You graduate, and the idea was, you know, the world is your oyster. Well, I'm sure that's true for some of you, but a lot of people are graduating off a cliff into the worst job market since the Great Depression. Graduating off of a cliff 
with sometimes $50,000 in debt, $100,000 in debt. We changed the rules so they can never declare bankruptcy. So they, they're under that $100,000 uh, uh, debt burden, praying to get an unpaid internship for two years in America. Some people from, from the best schools in the country. And we're a better country than that. Uh, we, we are in a situation where uh, the people who we were taught to respect as young people uh, are now being called public employees and kind of thrown under the bus. Well, these he's public employees, you know, got to get rid of them. I never met a public employee when I was growing up. Um, did you? Right. Uh, we call them teachers, right. cops, firefighters, nurses, librarians, you know, the backbone of our economy. And uh, somehow now they're expendable. They never abandoned us in a crisis, not one time. But we hit a little financial hiccup. We want to abandon one million of them this year alone. There's something wrong in the country. And what you're seeing now is the voice of the people finally bursting through. And I think that this is significant for you. Those of you especially who are talking about uh, doing something in public service, this movement is a judgment. And it's a judgment not just against the folks who are on Wall Street. It is a judgment against the folks in Washington, D.C in both parties. And it's a judgment against the civil rights establishment and the social change establishment and the NGO establishment. All of us who have for, the, for decades now promised that change was on the way, promised that uh, things are going to get better, just click on this petition, things will get better. Write another check to us, things will get better. Uh, come to this rally, things will get better. Vote for this candidate, things will get better. And people realize that things are not getting better and help is not on the way, and that there are millions of Americans who now feel abandoned, not just by the Wall Street elite, but by the political class itself, meaning us. And this upsurge of uh, energy and uh, uh, passion opens a doorway to a new kind of politics. This act I actually missed it the first time this dynamic began to bubble up in our country because it was called the Tea Party. Uh, I'm on the left, it was on the right. I missed it. I missed the significance of it. But the, the Tea Party was the first kind of judgment on, 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 on the political class, saying, listen, we don't think you guys have our interest at heart. And when I looked into the Tea Party to try to understand a little bit more about what was going on, I learned a ton. And here's what I want to share with you. This is what I think is happening in the country. There is a struggle now between democracy and plutocracy. Now, you guys are smarter than me. Anybody know what plutocracy means? The, the, you, you, you guys are at Harvard. I went to the University of Tennessee at Martin undergraduate, so I'm going to give you the, the cheat sheet answer. Uh, the cheat sheet answer is its rule of, by, and for the rich. That's plutocracy. And there's a sense that's settled into the country now that not only is that what's happening, but that's acceptable that people understand that the rules are being written for the people at the top. Uh, people talk about the occupation of Wall Street. I don't think the occupation of Wall Street is the most important fact in American politics. The occupation of Wall Street is a response and a reaction to the occupation by Wall Street of Washington, D.C. with their 20,000 lobbyists. That is the real occupation that is going on in America. And I think the American people have finally hit a tipping point where plutocracy, the idea that if you're rich enough, you can buy your own congressperson, you can buy your own rules, uh, that the American dream has now been inverted. It used to be the idea was if you work hard and play by the rules, you can get somewhere. That's a good part of the American dream, that you don't have to be a certain skin color. You don't have to be from a family that's, that's rich. You don't have to be, have a famous last name. You don't have to have a certain shape of your eyes or color. That if you work hard and you're willing to play by the rules, you can get somewhere. What is happening in this country, and I've, I've seen it all across the country now, the people who are working the hardest are falling the furthest behind. They're working one job, two jobs, or they can't find a job. And they look over the other side of the tracks and they see people who don't seem to be working in the same way, breaking the rules and getting ahead. No matter how hard the majority works, the quote unquote 99% works, the sense is we can't succeed 
And no matter how many times these other folks break the rules, they can't fail. Why? They're too big to fail. They're too big to fail. And I think that what you're hearing from the American people now is a sense that, hold on a second, when does the middle class get to be too big to fail? When do working families get to be too big to fail? When do our communities get to be too big to fail? When do these schools and these children and their dreams get to be too big to fail? And this is a judgment on all of us. And I think we have to respond. Now, there are three possible ways to get this economy going. And I think that we've got to find a way to, to relate the actual solutions that are available to us to the protests that are going on across the country. Uh, the, the, the Tea Party was a remarkable exercise in people-powered politics. Uh, those people who didn't study it closely may not know this. Who wrote Pop Quiz? Now, you guys are all political people, right? Listen to NPR? Let's see, Huffington Post? <laughs> who wrote the Tea Party jobs agenda? The, the agenda that they have for the, for the country, for the economy, the Tea Party, most important uh, development in uh, American politics probably uh, in the past couple of years. Who wrote their agenda? Their agenda is called the Contract from America. Who wrote it? Sarah Palin? Hmm? Dick Armey? The, Co oh, the Dave, David Cope? Hmm? The, a, a church wrote it? You know who wrote it? 50,000 people. It was a wiki. 50,000 people worked on it together, collectively, to produce a document called The Contract from America. The Tea Party itself is not a normal organization in the sense that it used, it used to have them in the last century. It's, it's an open source brand. We have to learn from this. Do you know what I mean? It's not a normal organization. I mean, you can't, get in a, you can't fly to Washington, D.C. and get in a cab and say, take me to Tea Party headquarters. Right? And then have the car, you know, cab drive up to a building, and you get out and it says, Tea Party headquarters. Right? You buzz on the buzzer, go in, talk to the receptionist, steal a mint. <laughs> I know how you do. <laughs> and say, let me talk to the president of the Tea Party. You can't do that, because right? there is no headquarters. There is no buzzer. There is no receptionist. Right? There's no mint. There's no president. There's no Tea Party. The Tea Party is an open source brand that 3,528 affiliates use, none of them own. Think about that. 3,528 affiliates use that brand, none of them own it. In fact, they all kept their own names that they had before, but they just put a comma behind their name. These groups, some of them go all the way back to the Ross Perot days. These are not new groups, but they have a new way of operating that lets them have a kind of shareware approach to their politics. And these old groups with uh, fairly old ideas were able to realign themselves with a new brand and move with great force in American politics. There's something remarkable about what they did there's a hypocrisy in what they did that I think is brilliant. The Tea Party talks rugged individualism. That's their main shtick, right? If you have a problem, don't look to the government. Just be more rugged <laughs> and more individual, and everything will be just fine. That's their basic thing. So they talk rugged individualism. They've just enacted, though, the most collectivist strategy for taking power in the history of the republic. 50,000 people working together on a wiki. An open source brand that they share. <laughs> now think about that. They talk individualism, but they act collectively in ways that you know, any kindergarten teacher would be proud. Right? Now look at, look at, look at progressives. I hope I don't offend anybody. I don't think we have any progressives here. <laughs> but if you ever meet one, they talk. You know where I'm going, Omaha. They talk 
Kumbaya. They talk. Can't we all get along? They talk. Solidarity forever. They talk collectively. But they tend to act with extraordinary levels of individualism in the extreme. Right? Silos inside of silos, on top of silos. I'm working for the Left-Handed Lesbian of Color Caucus. Again, it's like, well, I'm sure they deserve one. <laughs> and that's good. But it's hard to find the common ground sometimes. And so what happens is, and I don't think it's anything about it, because if you're in that caucus, I'm for you, I'll write you a check. But the problem is that at some point, the, the center of the donut, where we come together again, we haven't taken that step until now. Suddenly, a pain threshold got hit. I would go so far as to say that Occupy Wall Street, which, by the way, is as popular, uh, is twice as popular as the Tea Party, and is more popular than the President of the United States, more popular than the President of the United States, plus the Democrats in Congress, more popular, these young people out here protesting, than the President of the United States, plus the Democrats in Congress, plus the Republicans in Congress. These young people protesting are more popular with the American people, including Republicans, than the US government. Think about that. I would say that Occupy represents a judgment on the Tea Party, too. Now, this is where things get deep. And this is where we need to talk. The Tea Party is right to point out that something's wrong in the country. And they're right to point out that the little people are getting mistreated. But there's a problem with the worldview that says they are defending liberty. There are two threats to liberty, not just one. And this is where you are going to have to move forward, I think, as a generation of, of, of people. The threat to liberty doesn't just come from excessive concentrations of governmental authority. That's totalitarianism, which we're opposed to. And the Tea Party is very loud about that. They say, we do not want a totalitarian government. Neither do we. We appreciate that. But the other threat to liberty they've been quiet on. This is why you see this huge new explosion. The second threat to liberty is not from excessive concentrations of political authority, excessive concentrations of government authority, but from excessive concentrations of economic power. That's where they've been silent. It's, 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 you say, you know, Obama is a socialist. That's their thing. That's a fear that the government is trying to take over the economy. The government is trying to take over the economy. Obama is a socialist. We must defend our liberty. What if it's the other way around? What if the corporations are trying to take over our government? What if Citizens United that ruling that says that corporations are people and can spend all the money they want to in our elections. What if that is actually the real threat to our liberty? Who, is the, who will defend us from that threat? And it turns out that people no, no longer trust the Republicans to do it. They no longer trust the Democrats to do it. They don't trust the White House to do it. And they don't even trust the Tea Party to do it. There is an undefended middle class in America, an undefended working class in America, facing an unopposed demolition of their living standards. And who, whoever in public life can speak to that pain, not just to stoke it, but to offer solutions, will find a tremendous, tremendous audience. If you go to Occupy Wall Street in New York, you find Tea Party people down there. You find veterans down there. You find business owners down there. You even find some people who work on Wall Street down there because things have gotten that bad. And so we do have solutions. Uh, I'll speak to one, which I'm proud of, because I was a part of getting it pulled together. And then we'll take some questions. First of all, before Occupy took off this summer, I decided it was important that people who weren't in the Tea Party but who loved the country to have a chance to speak on their economic vision, their economic hopes. So we said, well, what if we got, instead of uh, that Tea Party crowdsourcing exercise going, what if we got another one going? So we created something called the Contract for the American Dream. 
we didn't have Fox TV, we didn't have the Koch brothers, all we had was you know, good liberal progressive groups like MoveOn.org and the Center for Community Change and SEIU, Planned Parenthood, but we worked together. For the first time in a long time, we started working together. He said, if they can work together, why don't we work together? And we use them as a foil to get us to work together. You gotta do that sometimes in politics. Guess what? We didn't get 50,000 people to work on, this, on our jobs agenda. We got 131,203, almost tripled the Tea Party number this summer, progressives and liberals working on solutions. You people, these people have no solutions. They're just protesting. They have no ideas. They're just out there mad. So, first of all, this movement is not powerless enough to have demands. They're not powerless enough. Powerful people don't have demands. Powerful people have goals. <laughs> Power, you, don't, you don't go to talk to the, the head of somebody on Wall Street and say, well, you know, what are your demands? They say, I don't have demands. I have actual power, so I have some goals. So, uh, uh, well, this movement is growing up, and it has the power of a kind of moral clarity. They don't have message clarity often, but they have moral clarity. And, and, and that moral clarity has given them uh, tremendous uh, uh, momentum. But it's actually not true that we're only crowdsourcing a focus on the problem on the left. We also have been able to crowdsource a set of solutions. 131,203 people got together and came up with a coherent jobs agenda called the Contract for the American Dream. You don't know that because uh, we don't have Fox Brothers to, I mean the Fo Fox uh, News to tell you about it. <laughs> Fox Brothers, Koch Brothers, I get confused. But, but, but that's true. Tea Party, when they started off, they had 800 house meetings all across the country. We said, we can, why, why don't we try and do some house meetings? We had 1,597. Just three shy had double the Tea Party. This summer, this is before Occupy. We said, there's something out there. People, want, people are hurting. People want solutions. And so now we are in a new era of American politics. The elites are no longer trusted. I'm not trusted. You're not trusted. People are now turning to a people on both sides of the aisle to more people-powered, horizontal politics. And they want a more people-powered uh, uh, economics and people-oriented economics that takes some of the control away from the, not just from the government, but also from the big corporations. This is new territory. It's a tremendous opportunity for us to stand together. Um, I'll close and, and take questions from you, but I do think that there is a moral challenge here no matter what side of the political divide you're on. If you think there's something wrong with these protesters, if you think there's something wrong with what they're saying or, or how they're saying it or how they look when they're saying it, <laughs> the clothes they're wearing when they're saying it, or, then you do have a responsibility to explain, and not just to kind of wave at magical tax cuts or whatever, but to explain how these people are going to be able to live indoors. The, the, the Occupy movement is fighting in the short term for the right to sleep outdoors, but they stand for a desire for millions of people to keep sleeping indoors. And the people who criticize them have to answer the question now. Have to answer the question, how are these people, as the big fact in the world economy hits home, which is that the middle class in Asia, God bless them, is getting bigger. But the middle class in the West is getting smaller. And the middle class in the United States is getting smaller. And we can no longer have uh, little uh, 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 food fights in Washington, D.C. and pretend we're solving the problem when millions of people know the problem's not being solved. So if you think they're wrong, you have a moral challenge to come forward and explain how the pain they're talking about is going to be alleviated. You don't have people sitting on a white hot stove for three years. We're three years into the biggest economic catastrophe since the Great Depression, and nothing's getting better. So you can't tell them that they're wrong, that they're not hollering appropriately. You're out there hollering, where is your proposal for derivatives reform? <laughs> Are you kidding me? So you got a moral challenge on that side, but we got a moral challenge too. If this movement's gonna be anything, and it's gotta be something serious, but if it's gonna be anything, 
It can't be the 99% against the 1%. The 99% against the 1%, I don't want to have anything to do with that. It's got to be the 99% standing for the 100%. Now, this is a moral challenge. We need the genius and the creativity of the entire American people to solve these problems. Just because you're a banker doesn't make you the enemy. If you're a bankster, then we got a problem with you. If you're just somebody who understands finance, God bless you, we need that. And if you're working for a credit union, God bless you twice. It's what you do with your genius. If you use it to buy your own rules and buy your own congressperson, if you use it to run a bank that was bailed out by the people, you'd be homeless, except the people bailed you out. And then you, rather than turn, returning the favor, you smother students under debt and won't cut them a break. You smother those homeowners. Uh, with bad mortgages, underwater, won't cut them a break. You won't give that little small business owner, that small farmer, that veteran coming home alone. You're, you're, you're smothering the country under a debt blanket, choking off capital. You caused the recession, and now you won't let the recovery happen. Well, and you buy Congress to make sure that you stay in that position. You're not a banker now. You're a bankster, and we're opposed to your action, not your person. And we want this 99% is now standing for the 100%. They have to be a part of the solution. Now, this is hard. But we have a moral example in the young people themselves. When they were pepper sprayed, the young people who were out there by themselves, and I had nothing to do with them, neither did you. You thought they were crazy, and, you know, I guess it was good that they were. Because when they got pepper sprayed, those two young women, standing there, completely innocent. Didn't have a, pro, a, a poster, a sign, nothing in their hands. And were pepper sprayed and fell to their knees crying. And the world saw it. They came back the next day. And they said, we are not fighting against the police. We are fighting for them. We're concerned about their pensions. We're concerned about their families. They are a part of the 99% too. That's a moral movement. They're better than me. Uh, they're better than most people I work with in Washington, DC. They're better than anybody in any political party. And we have a tremendous opportunity to stand with them and to be the 99% standing for the 100%. So let's talk about it. Thank you very much. We've got plenty of time for question and answers. We have mic four microphones throughout the, throughout the forum, so I urge you if you have questions. Uh, we have our traditions here at the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Uh, please identify yourself if you have an affiliation with the school or a community, just let us know. Uh, secondly, a question ends in a question mark. And third, it does not contain a speech in the question. <laughs> so those are our traditions. Tonight, we're going to actually uh, try something a little bit different because we have a lot of folks, and there's also a microphone up there with nobody in line behind it. So if you're near the end of one of these lines, go to the microphone up there. Um, but we're gonna do this. We're gonna take a couple questions at a time on, because we know we're not gonna be able to get to everybody. And we thought that maybe some of the questions, um, Ben can, this is his idea. So if it doesn't work, you'll never see it again on the forum. <laughs> if it does work, we'll give him the credit. But we're gonna do a couple at a time. So if you could just kind of quickly identify yourself and we'll do, let's do one to try two at a time. We'll try these two first and we'll go from there. So right here, gentlemen. Hi, my name is Luke Scanlon. I'm a student here at the Kennedy School. My background prior to coming here, I was actually a Tea Party leader in Cypress, Texas. And I'm here studying bank finance to understand how to not screw it up later in life. <laughs> Thank you. So my question to you is that someone who comes from a conservative background and a Tea Party person, my goal, rather than to sit on opposite sides of a fence, is trying to figure out where we have common ground. When I have discussion with people that are on the left side here at the Kennedy School, which is most, <laughs> usually they come away from the conversation surprised that we have more agreement than we have disagreement. And my hope is that somehow between the rhetoric between people that are conservative, people that are left, Tea Party, 
your movement, that we can find a chance to put aside the sound bites and get down to real substance. What do you intend and how are you going to try to step aside from the sound bites? How are you going to try to step aside from the unfortunate jabs that I know occur to reach out and actually cause substantive conversation that gets to the core of the problem? Yeah, my name is Mike Mon. I'm a joint uh, MBA and Master's of Public Administration here. Uh, one thing that you repeated several times is that uh, they don't have Fox or Coke um, or the Coke brothers. I, I kind of reject that argument because they have George Soros and they have MSNBC. So I'm, I'm curious when you say there's no message clarity there. Uh, clearly, they have avenues that could support them. Um, and I wonder to what extent you think that that lack of clarity of argument um, is based on the fact that there's um, not yet a, a unified purpose beyond complaint and how uh, this movement can mobilize beyond actually complaining against something and catalyze people to mobilize for something. That's good. Well, well first of all, uh, you know, Luke Skywalker, I've been following you my whole life and uh, I appreciate you being here. Um, is that your name? <laughs> what, what's your name? Scanlon. Oh. It was Luke Skywalker, or okay. Scanlon. <laughs> Luke Scanlon, okay, good. Uh, that's a cool name. Uh, you, you said Luke Sk. I was like, really? I've been looking for you my whole life, man. Um, well, Luke Scanlon asked a great question about common ground. And um, uh, you know, I think that we're getting there. Uh, not because of anything the political elites did, uh, who actually, you know, probably benefit more from the food fight than anybody else. But because I just think that, the, that, that, that neither side in D.C. has solved the problem, and the problem's getting worse. Uh, we're probably going to be in a double-dip recession. Uh, they'll be finger-pointing over that. So you'll say, well, you, you, you spent too much on the stimulus, and you'll say, well, the stimulus is too small, and we'll be in the same food fight in D.C. Um, banks are bad shape. They may come back out with their hands held out. And there's going to be a moment again. We'll, we'll do 2008 all over again. And we'll have to, and I, and I, and I, but I think there's a dynamic here where uh, there may be some dueling populisms, you know, more Tea Party, more Occupy, but there's, those dueling populisms may be bigger than the, the, the dueling parties. And that's going to be a very different uh, scenario, I think, in American politics. Um, you know, I will say this. I've, I've been surprised by how uh, little interest there has been, or how, 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 how little uh, my sisters and brothers on the right have noticed how eager, I think sometimes even overly eager, Democrats have been to reach out. And, and I think that there may be something off there where it's really hard, I think, to come to a good deal if one side is absolutely firm and clear and the other side is, is, is not. And so what may look like too much partisanship may in fact be a lack of, of good partisanship, a, a lack of good clarity, which goes to, to your point. Um, you know, we'll, we'll disagree on the facts in terms of uh, the, the uh, uh, you know, MSNBC versus Fox. Um, uh, you know, frankly, George Soros doesn't give a lot of money in the United States. He just doesn't. And so uh, there's this myth that George Soros, I mean, if you look at the amount of money the Koch brothers put in American politics, if George Soros put that money, much money in American politics, given the level of organization the left already has from the community level all the way up, it'd be a totally different playing field. But he just actually doesn't. And so, but I think you're making another point. And that point is uh, the conservative movement has done, I think, a brilliant job of being clear about its politics. So you can say conservative anywhere, and people know exactly what they're buying with that. You know, they, you know, smaller government, strong defense, family values, it just comes right out, the mouth, out of the mouth. If you say Democrat right now, are you getting Dennis Kucinich or Larry Summers? Which one are you talking, I mean, there's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> you can call it a big tent or you can call it a big mess, but that's the Democratic Party. So, to your point, I think, I think that you're, you, you make a good point. Uh, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a journey that we have to go on from the complaint to the answer. But let me, let me say this to you, in defense of the people who are out there. Um, moral clarity matters. Part of what we should all be ashamed of is that when the polls were telling us 
all summer long that people wanted DC to be focused on job creation, not on the default, uh, whatever the default crisis, that, 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 that people wanted the wars to be wound down in a responsible way, bring the money and the troops home, $3 billion a week, bring it home, help us. The political class in DC didn't register it as a, at, at all. They stayed in that same conversation that it left out so many people that finally people had to go to these kind of measures just to be heard. Now, they've only been out there for six weeks. They may not have a PhD level answer in six weeks, but I think that it would be wrong and I think that people are making a mistake to dismiss uh, the level of intelligence they've brought forward already. They have already punctured a very almost uh, ironclad wall that says you cannot criticize Wall Street, uh, you cannot talk about economic inequality, you cannot talk about this sort of hourglass shape in the economy. If you do, you get dismissed as a socialist or a kook. Now, Eric Cantor, uh, one of my favorite politicians, <coughs> um, said <coughs> that um, uh, economic inequality troubles him. You can Google or use a search engine You'll never find Eric Cantor in, in the word economic inequality in the same sentence before these young people. Now that's genius, right? That's genius. And I think that, we'll, we'll, I think that as they go forward, they will mature. Uh, and I don't mean that in some ageist way. I just mean that as things develop, they get more clarity. Also, you're gonna see the political class as it exists respond. I think you have to be a nut if you're a Democrat and you don't come out right now and say you're for, for student loan uh, uh, relief or forgiveness. You're a nut. I think you're a nut if you don't come out and say uh, tax uh, Wall Street speculation or, or if we get back in a situation where the banks are struggling again to at least put on the table, uh, breaking them up and, and uh, uh, making them actually uh, 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 eliminate some of these monopolistic uh, uh, pressures and speculation. So uh, this is early on, you know, break out the popcorn. <laughs> it's going to be a long, a long, uh, 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 not, not just a movie, but a trilogy, as this new generation steps forward and tries to redefine politics. Let's, let's keep going in pairs. So will these two uh, questioners? Me first? Yes, you go for your first. Hi, um, Van, you already know me, but I'm going to ask well, we, a question. The rest of us don't know you. Um, but uh, my name is Jocelyn Eastman, and I'm a progressive independent. I've worked for a number of progressive organizations like the Ella Baker Center and Green for All. Um, Two great organizations, by the way. <laughs> so founded them. by a genius. In Oakland. I'm a, um, a junior at um, the, uh, the college. I'm studying history and AFAM studies. So my question to you is, um, as, well, as a student, I can't go to Occupy Boston and Occupy Wall Street every day. I just can't. Yep. My parents would kill me if I got arrested. <laughs> so what can students like me, who can't go out every day and hold a picket sign and, and get pepper spray do to support um, Occupy Wall Street and its offshoots? Good. Um, that's a great question. Uh, you know, Occupy Together is the, the uh, place I think most people are going to get more information and find ways to be helpful. Uh, people may not understand the way that Occupy is put together, so just you know, really quickly. There's Occupy Wall Street, which is the people who are actually on Wall Street. All the other occupations are independent and autonomous. There is no national steering committee for the occupation. Um, that's part of its genius, because if there were one, then they would probably <laughs> either get arrested or bribed and um, we, we'd have like, you know, Occupy you know, Diet Cola within three months, you know, <laughs> that's, just how, it's like, that's just how our system goes. So, but there is no, <laughs> there is no national steering committee, so uh, there will, we won't, we won't uh, have that outcome. But, uh, you know, rebuildthedream.com is another alternative. Uh, there are solutions, and like I said, we had a, more than 100,000 people work together to come up with some. And the solutions actually that used to be called liberal solutions poll at 50 to 80 percent. You know, green jobs still polls 50 to 80 uh, percent. Uh, infrastructure investment 50 to 80 percent, depending on how, how you word it. Uh, taxing Wall Street, ending the Bush tax cuts for, for wealthy people is like 85 percent. So the problem that we're having in our country is that with no, I mean, you may disagree. My, my friend, my friend left Mike, but. Uh, might may disagree, but in my world, my little movie I live in, with basically no real fight back on these economic issues, we still have the majority of the country who are open to progressive ideas, but we don't have a mechanism to get those ideas taken seriously. And so rebuild, rebuildthedream.com uh, supports something called the American Dream Movement 70 
uh, progressive organizations that actually have aligned on an economic agenda. 600,000 people we've signed up since uh, in three months in every congressional district. And so I'd encourage you to, to get involved with us as well. Hello. Hi, Amy Perlmutter, uh, mid-career, 93, long time ago. Hi. <laughs> um, I appreciate your comments, and, and uh, as someone who is a progressive, just the fact that this movement is bigger than the Tea Party is reassuring because I'm worried about this country and I'm worried about um, what I hear in the polls, which is a little bit different from what you just said. And I thought that something came out um, through Gallup a week or two ago that said that people were not in favor of, of repealing the Bush tax cuts. And there seems to be sort of a what's the matter with Kansas mentality in the country, at least from this little bubble of Cambridge, that people see themselves in the 1% even though they're in the 99%. And so if you agree or disagree, I'm just curious of your thoughts on that and how we get people to realize that they are the 99%. Good, good question. I'm gonna try a second one over here. Thanks. Mark Tomizawa, part of an independent group of consultants across all sectors and silos. Um, frankly, it, the big problem is turf. The, the, la the hardest thing to do in any corporation, let's picture the United States as one big corporation, you wouldn't divide up the corporation into teams that battle each other. You'd divide them up into functioning work groups. And then you'd go at solutions, and then you'd float those by leadership, and you'd then make your decisions, but you'd start with really good solutions that are built on, say, evidence-based policy. Let's go find things that work and build from there. We don't see that happening anywhere. And one of the problems we see is everybody starts out by wearing a penny, a red penny or a blue penny, breaking up into teams, when maybe that team's quarterback is needed with this team's linebackers, right? You start to build other kinds of teams. Who's working on that? Because the policy people are all divided up, up and down DC. The nonprofits start dividing up. And if we start with that virus, maybe it's hard to put America back together. So who's creating a place that's based on great evidence-based policy that's built around function? And floating that and saying, how do the candidates respond to that? Well, uh, two, two questions, I'll try to answer them both quickly so we can get, get a, few, a few more. I mean, your, your question is, uh, you know, where are the American people and, and why do the American people sometimes not vote or, 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 or register opinions based on, on what we, you might imagine, might, I might imagine, are the self-interest? Uh, I mean, the polling data that I've seen is actually more encouraging than discouraging. Uh, and well, frankly, when, by the time Warren Buffett comes out and says, tax me, I mean, I mean, it gives you a sense of where the country is. I think 56% of Republicans are saying to raise taxes on the wealthy rather than close down these schools, et cetera. So, so I mean, I think I mean, the country's a lot better than, uh, a lot, the country's a lot more balanced. Uh, I, think, I think the country is, is, is ready to, to, to raise some revenues. You know, billionaires, big oil, uh, the wars, those kind of places where, where you know, the, the, the tax breaks have been going and a lot of money, I think people are ready for a change on that. And I don't think you have to run through the same bug zappers anymore. Uh, to, 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 point, to point out that we shouldn't be giving the, 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 the you know, big oil, which is the most uh, lucrative uh, business on the planet, still big tax breaks and subsidies. That's not a, you don't have to run through a bug zapper on that, at least, in a, you can go into a laundromat. And now, if you're, if you're on a Sunday talk show, you might get beat up. But you can go to a laundromat or a sports bar, any place in America, and say, geez, you know, Wall Street and Halliburton and, and uh, uh, the big oil companies are getting away with murder. Nobody's going to throw anything at you, they'll, they'll say, yeah, keep talking. So I think the country's in better shape on that. Now, to your point with regard to policy stuff, there's all kind of bipartisan, I mean, I, I disagree with you, there's all kind of bipartisan uh, working groups. They don't get anything done, and I'll tell you why they don't. There's this thing called politics, which is different than policy. And until we find a way to make uh, the politics work better, in other words, where people are afraid they're gonna get primaried if they don't cooperate with the other side, as opposed to you get primaried if you do cooperate with the other side. Then we're gonna see the same log jam that we've got there. But, we, but, we, but we're working on that, let's talk about it later. Okay, let's, do, let's do two more, and, and uh, since we've got a, still up several folks standing, if, if the questions can be a little more concise, we can get to everybody. These two up on the uh, lower. 
Yeah. Y'all are smart. It's, she ran up there before you get, got, got there. Go ahead. Hi, Van. My name is Noelle Janka, and I work here at the Kennedy School. But in my other life, I'm a grassroots organizer. Um, I did Green Corps program. I worked on the Obama campaign. Um, but I've been really depressed, also very excited about the Occupy movement. But because of my organizing background, I just can't help but but think about the strategy. Like, what is our strategy? What are we thinking about doing three months from now? And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, your plans with Rebuild the Dream and how, how we're gonna work with this broken political system that ostracizes so much of our country and how, what this election might look like and are people actually gonna vote and that kind of thing. Thank you. All right, so you, get, you made a kind of a joke earlier about you know, the derivatives, like you know, you're, you're out here protesting, but where is your derivatives reform? But I think a lot of people on Wall Street, you know, I'm a you know, student in the, in the college, and a lot of my friends, a lot of people graduate and go on to Wall Street, and I ask them, you know, what do you all think about the, the movement? And they say, oh, we, we laugh at them. It's, we, we think it's a joke. And I think a lot of the reason people, you know, the elite or whoever you want to, whatever, how you want to label them, don't respect Occupy Wall Street is kind of two reasons. There's no really proposal or solution. That it just seems that you know, there just really isn't one. And also, there doesn't really seem to be a thing that underlies all of them beyond, you know, we're all upset about something. And I think, you know, I agree with you in the sense that it's kind of too early to contextualize it, and it's too much to expect of, like, a three-, six-month-old movement to have that. But Three-week, uh, six-week-old week movement. Yeah, six-week-old movement to have that. But, you know, three months, you know, a year, three, six months, a year from now, when, you know, they don't have that excuse anymore, what do you think a proposal looks like? What do you think, you know, something that underlies them looks like? Because, you know, abolitionists came in all shapes and sizes, but they all wanted, you know, to get rid of slavery. Civil rights, you know, people who were in the civil rights movement came in all shapes and sizes, but what underlies all of them is that they all wanted, you know, to end segregation and Jim Crow. But it seems right now, you know, you have all these people, and then what underlies them is, you know, we're all upset about something or another, and people don't respect that. Mm -hmm. Good enough. Yeah, one more. Yeah, let's try one more. Yeah. Let's go. Okay, um, I'm Ali, I'm an undergraduate here, and I've been down to Occupy doing like environmental stuff, and I've had labor guys come up to me and be like, hey, you're protesting my job. So you talked a bit about like getting the progressive movement to work together better, so how do you suggest we do that with issues like the labor guys need jobs right now, but climate change has a really tight deadline. So how do you suggest we go forward with that, with Occupy? It's good, well I have an answer for that one, so I'll do that, I'll do that one last. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, uh, my, my uh, uh, sister who was working as an organizer, a couple of things. One, you know, we went from Hopi, you remember that? Everybody was all Hopi, 2008, right? We went from Hopi to Mopi, right? Real fast. You said you were depressed. Um, yeah, we went from Hopi to Mopi, we, and we forgot to build that big fight back in the middle, right, where we weren't just chasing the White House and hoping the White House would listen to us, but we forgot to build a movement the White House would have to chase. And that's what's beginning to happen now, is that you're starting to see things that are happening that don't fit the script. And I think that that's, uh, that is a very good thing. Uh, both of the, 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 the two questions have to go, what is the strategy going to be? Well, I think that the, I can't speak to that. I'm not a part of Occupy. I'm a fan of Occupy. I'm awestruck by what they've been able to achieve. Uh, I mean, they represent, just by the way, if people don't pay attention to this stuff, this is, this is a swarm. Those of you who do network theory, starfish and the spider, this is a for, for real swarm. Uh, Arab Spring was a swarm, right? This is a for real swarm. And swarms don't function like normal organizations. They don't function, they don't, they don't have Robert's Rules of Order, they don't function like co coalitions. This is, a, this is something that we have to get smart enough to understand how to interact with. And I'm learning. I'm, uh, and when it comes to Occupy, I'm not a leader, I'm a learner. I can tell you what I think makes sense. What I think makes sense is a lot of stuff that's in our, in our contract, which I encourage, encourage you to look at, the contract for the American dream. I think uh, we're going to have to do two things. One, we're going to have to have some smart Keynesianism. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not uh, convinced that when you have these kinds of concentrations of wealth, where we're not recirculating it, the problem is, fine, if you, first of all, just let me say a couple things. There's a misunderstanding, I think, that a lot of the people who are out there just don't like capitalism. They just don't like a system where you have winners and losers. They just want everybody to be kind of like sitting around. That's not actually why people are mad. That's not why I'm mad. I like winning. Let's just be clear. I'm as competitive as anybody in this room. I like winning. I hate a rigged game. 
See, that's what's making people upset. It's not the sense that you got winners and losers. It's the sense that the game is rigged and that you don't actually have fear competition. You start, I mean, in the energy sector, which we'll get you to, to, to the last point, there, we definitely feel that uh, if you want a free market in energy, we're with you. But that ain't what we got. In the energy sector, what we've got is monopoly control by the carbon uh, uh, burners, and everybody else is competing against the fact that they get direct subsidies, they get support from the Pentagon to bring their for-profit private product here called oil, and they get to pollute for free. That's a massive set of subsidies for the carbon burners. They get to pollute for free. If you get a ticket for littering, you can't pollute for free. If you, get a, if you go out here and litter right now, you'll get a $25 fine. That's $25 more than the big carbon polluters have ever paid in 150 years since the Industrial Revolution for all the carbon they've dumped. So they get a massive subsidy. They don't have to pay to pollute. You have to pay when you pollute. They don't. The Pentagon spends 70% of its budget trying to help them get their for-profit private product here, and they get subsidies. That, people say, we, we believe in the free market. I do, too. I believe in it so much, I'd like to see one. I'd like to see a free market in the energy sector. Okay, so there's a big misunderstanding about a lot of this stuff. But I like, I like, I like to win. I like, but if you, div, if you rig the game, you divide the playground. If, if you rig the game, you divide the playground. And eventually, kids stop playing or they start acting up. And that's what we see, that's what we see happening right here. Now, for me, I just, I'm, I'm old fashioned. People, you know, sometimes, I don't think our grandparents were stupid. I'm sorry. I just don't think our grandparents were stupid. I think when our grandparents put Glass-Steagall into place to keep Wall Street from becoming a casino, I think they knew what they were doing. I don't think our grandparents were stupid. I think our, I, I, all those rules, I call them depression protection, right? All those depression protection regulations on Wall Street that were taken off the books when nobody was looking by both political parties, Democrats and Republicans said it would be a great idea to take our grandparents' wisdom and throw it in the garbage can and let Wall Street run itself like a casino. I'm old fashioned. I think our grandparents were right. And so I think that the first step is to, is to re-regulate Wall Street and, and to make sure that bankers can act like bankers and get capital to productive purposes and not just make money off of making money. The, the, the most Impressive innovations in American society shouldn't be how you make money off of money. It should be how you make products that help people, or at least products that people can understand. That's the problem. And so I think that what you're going to see is there are proposals, there are solutions out there, but nobody cared about them. The people with those proposals, like me and others, will get a bigger hearing now. And so it won't be that the people out there protesting are going to come up with a great proposal. It's that the people who are out there protesting will get attention to the people who have proposals. And, 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 and that is the way that this thing is going to ultimately uh, shake out. Somebody said that the, the, the it was, she, what was your name? Uh, what was your name? Allie. Allie. Allie said that she was out there trying to help the planet, and it turned out she was hurting the people because the construction worker said, you're putting me out of a job, and she just got confused. Is that right? I think that's how she said it. Yeah. yeah. Welcome to my world, okay? Uh, the short answer on that, because I want to make sure others get a chance to talk, is that we should put those construction workers back to work doing things that will actually uh, help us beat climate change. We can beat the global recession and global warming at the same time. We can fight poverty and pollution at the same time by putting people to work, putting up the solar panels, building the wind turbines, making our homes more energy efficient, uh, uh, bringing agriculture away from the big uh, agribusiness model that's incredibly carbon intensive and poison intensive, and bringing that stuff closer in to cities, bringing the food closer to the plate. All of these things can be done, and they can be done on a for-profit basis. But the, here's the thing, markets, which are great. I like my iPad. I don't think a government committee could have given me my iPad. I like my iPad, OK? I like markets. I like, I like Markets doing what they do. Government has to do what it does. Community does what it does. Individuals do what they what do. It, but on market, the market side, I like what I like markets when they come up with cool stuff. But markets work according to rules, and right now the rules are wacky. The rules are wacky in energy. The rules are wacky in finance. 
the rules are wacky with regard to our, our food system. And as long as we have wacky rules, then the markets are going to give us things that we don't want, like poison in our food and, and asthma for our kids and Wall Street making money off of making money as opposed to helping entrepreneurs make products. And people are going to be mad. And it's going to be up to us to do our role as elites, which is to translate the pain into proposals, translate the pain into a politics that can actually solve the problem. And uh, I think that there is enough genius in this country to be able to do that and to do it well. This may have to be our last bundle of questions, so ask it quickly and we'll, yeah, yeah. we'll try to get uh, as many answers. We'll start here and we'll go through a couple of them. Uh, Mr. Jones, my name is Jack Cash and I'm a junior at the college. And I was wondering what your thoughts were about the conflict last night between Occupy Oakland and the police and also what happens when cities around the country stop letting occupiers occupy the land that they're on? That's a good, concise question. Yeah. Let's keep it up. Yes. Hi, my name is Lisa King. I was a mid-career student here last year, and I'm a fellow at the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy this year. And I've just been doing a lot of tweeting and Facebooking about the Occupy movement, and I've been struck by, this is just anecdotal observation, the lack of response by the hundreds of my Harvard peers who are friends of mine on Facebook and that it seems to be the people outside of Harvard who are the ones that are commenting on the stuff that I'm posting and it made me think about the moral imperative and the fact that the 1% is represented really well at Harvard or people that want to be part of the 1%. And how can we, how would you speak to this next generation of leaders coming up here at the Kennedy School and around Harvard about the moral imperative? Like what specifically are you wanting to point out about the division and the potential consequences of that. Why don't we take these last two and then we'll, um, no, you, you, you're not just standing? All right, take this last one. My name is Bob Romano and I have a, a company in Boston called Frugal Furniture. We have a, a number of stores and w I was here uh, last week when uh, Governor Rondell was here and uh, Todd Gitlin and he spoke uh, about, the same, about the same conversation. So I took out of that meeting um, that there's an opportunity for corporations to actually make a difference and be within your movement. Mm -hmm. And I, I ran an ad in the, in the Metro, a four-page ad, saying that as a corporation, we agree with uh, Occupy movement. Mm -hmm. And we distributed them uh, among Occupy Boston, which they weren't really too interested in reading, <laughs> which was which is a little different movement now than it was when it first started, mm -hmm. the, peop the people. And it was, all, it was brought to my attention from this ad. Uh, someone sent me a, uh, on the website of Ben and Jerry's, they have a full page, their front, front page, is they support the Occupy movement. So my question is, do you think that you could uh, get behind a movement, figure out a movement where corporations would actually be part of the 99? Because as far as I can see, I've got a lot of compliments from individuals working within corporations which reminded me when you said there are people, bankers on Wall Street, there are people working on Wall Street who are in the movement. I think that corporations need, you know, you need one big corporation where the CEO says, I'm not going to, I'm going to take, instead of $10 million, I'm going to take $1 million, and he, just, and he sends a letter to his stockholders saying, would you be behind, be getting behind the Occupy movement? Okay. So I want to know if, if what you think, if that's a realistic those are three cool. good, diverse questions. Unfortunately, that is going to have to be the last three. I yeah, apologize. That's so. good. Thank, thank you. Well, three, three great, great questions. I'll, I'll take a shot at them. Um, before I do, I, I, want, I want to point out that um, uh, I'll, I'll save it. Let me, let me just let me say, say this about, about Oakland. I, I, my heart was broken to see the, uh, I think, excessive response on the part of the Oakland Police Department last night. Um, there were women children, pregnant people, pregnant women. Uh, <laughs> as best I know, uh, I think that's still where we are technologically. Um, but I mean, people in wheelchairs, I mean, people, people saw the pictures, I'm sure. And there, there was you know, tear gas and rubber bullets and that kind of stuff, just not appropriate. I, I, here's the thing, I, I don't mean to offend anybody. Uh, the people who tend to congregate around Occupy Wall Street are not necessarily big strapping football playing type of guys. I mean, that just not really, that's not, it's really kind of more, like you don't have to have thousands of cops in ninja suits to deal with them. They're not those kind of people. They tend to be, if anything, more on the small side, more nerdy, people, people like myself. So 
I just think that that is bad. And what I'll say about it is the occupations themselves now have a special character. Uh, it used to be, you know, somebody just sitting at a lunch counter at one point would have been a completely neutral act. But there was a moment in American history where to sit in at a lunch counter was the most important political statement that could be made. And there was a need to respect that. Or burning a bra, you know, if somebody burned their bra, maybe they just didn't like their bra at some point. But at a certain point, that became a political statement. People wanting to put up tents in public spaces is a political statement. And it needs to be handled with some respect for the First Amendment uh, implications of that. It doesn't mean they can do whatever they want to, but there needs to be a certain level of respect. And we didn't see it last night in Oakland. I think that that's unfortunate. Um, the question about corporations and corporate involvement. This is critical. See, I don't think that the old categories quite are, are working. If you look at what would actually solve the problem, what would solve the problem? Well, first of all, corporations themselves, you now here's, you know, corporations themselves shouldn't be allowed to participate in our political system uh, as people. That, 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 that has to be reversed. The idea that, that money is speech and corporations are people. Uh, I saw a bumper sticker that says, I'll believe a corporation is a person when Texas executes one, right? That's, <laughs> Right. So, uh, so, so that has to, you know, that has to be reversed. Otherwise, we're just on the road to plutocracy. There's nothing you can do about it. So there's some big, big reforms we got to do. But now, that said, if you, how are you going to solve the problem? See, the old politics says we're for markets. Well, we're for government. Well, we're for markets. Well, we're for government. That wasn't what our grandparents were talking about. They understood very clearly, if you want to have an America that works, you got to fight against the worst in corporations. But you got to stick up for the best. You got to fight against the worst in government, but you got to stick up for the best. You got to fight against the worst at the community level, my community organizer friend, but stick up for the best. And you got to in insist that everybody do their personal best and contribute. That is a politics that can work. Everything about government's not good, but it's not bad either. Everything about corporations is not good, but it's not bad either. My friend earlier was talking about the need for us to have some common ground. That's real common ground. Uh, we've got great entrepreneurs in this country. You never hear about them. America's government should be on the side of our problem solvers in the economy, not the problem makers. We have great green entrepreneurs. I was just in Silicon Valley yesterday. There are people out there who care so much about the pain that people are going through, entrepreneurs with new corporations, their whole corporations are based on helping people help each other. Things like Kickstarter and Kiva and all these new models where they said, listen, incomes are going down, but we could maybe bring standards of living up if we were a nation of neighbors and we started using all these technologies to begin to share and, 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 and you don't have to spend as much money because you can actually be able to uh, uh, use the resources better together. For instance, I didn't know this, I will share it with you. How many of you have in your home or in your parents' home a power drill? A power drill. How many times in the past week have you used it? Oh, you used it, two. we got two, that's good. Right. Do you know how, how, how many minutes the average power drill is used before it's thrown away? Three. Zzz. Zzz. I mean, what if there's some way for us to share them? Right? So will it be bad for the economy? Well, it'll be bad for the economy in one way, but it also might free up some, some money <laughs> to go to things that are more productive. That's the genius of entrepreneurship. And we've got to be able to include that in this movement. Um, the last thing I'll say is just about young people. I have here, and I didn't know she was going to be here, uh, but when I was a young person, uh, a young law student at Yale, uh, see, I tricked you. I went to public schools for undergraduate. I went to fancy school for law school. <laughs> so I'm equally uncomfortable everywhere. See? Uh, um, but when I was a law student, uh, there was a young attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights where I work, and she took young people very seriously. And she spent a ton of time with me 
And I was lost and afraid and never been in a big city before, New York City. And um, she helped me on my way. And uh, uh, she took young people very seriously, and I do too. Her name is Suzanne Shindy. She's sitting right there. Give her a round of applause. Wave your hand, Suzanne. Um, I haven't seen her for almost 10 years, so I will, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here with you. But the young people now, and I want to close with this, the young people now should be taken even more seriously. And I'll tell you why. The last time you had a big generational bulge come through American society, they were called the baby boomers. And when they turned into teenagers and got in their early 20s, they changed America permanently. Right? We had 227 years of enslavement, or maybe more, and 100 years of Jim Crow. Think about that. We had to fight a civil war to go from enslavement to apartheid. Okay, that was right, that's that's a, that's, a, that's that's you had a long way to go to, to get to a real democracy in our country. But these young people. February 1st, 1960, started sitting in. And between 1960 and 1970, the country is completely unrecognizable. From 1959 to 1969, it's a different country. Why? Because of those young people. The millennial generation is bigger than the baby boomers. Get that. Bigger than the baby boomers. They're more diverse ethnically, culturally, and otherwise. They're more technologically savvy. They're essentially born connected. They're more ecologically conscious. They're more communitarian in their values than any generation of Americans. When they stood up, 2008, they made history. They sat down, 2010, they made history the other direction. Now they're standing up. They're standing up out here at Occupy Wall Street. They're standing up with 350.org which is, as an environmental organization, I think they got like four staffers and they do like global events and, and you know, they're completely rewriting the rules of politics, of how NGOs are supposed to work. Uh, they're horizontal rather than vertical. They're distributed. Uh, they share. This is an extraordinary generation and many of you are a part of it or close enough to it to understand its power and its impact. And what we have to do, those of us who are a little bit older now, uh, and those of us who are a part of the establishment, um, have to be willing to go from being leaders to learners. This generation has a ton to teach all of us about how to do more with less when it comes to money uh, and, and big grants and that kind of stuff, how to go around systems. They, they, they see a system, they automatically think they have the right to tinker with it, to hack into it, to make it better, to improve it, to personalize it. What if government worked that way? What if government services worked that way? That's where we're headed. We're headed to a much more resilient democracy out of all of this chaos and a much more people-friendly, planet-friendly economy out of all the creativity that will be unleashed by this crisis and the response of a new generation to it. Uh, those of you who are here, who are part of that generation, I salute you. Uh, those of you who are here, who are learning from it, uh, please share uh, the information for those of us who don't tweet as much as we should and actually read essays. Uh, I'd like to have more information about it, and I thank you very much for your time.